In the early hours of a chilly morning in Toronto, Canada in 2017, a young couple was seen walking down a driveway together. 45 minutes later, only one of them came back up. The results of these three quarters of an hour would devastate a family, shake the community, and have an enduring effect on a nation. In a hip part of town, known to locals affectionately as Gay Village, Tess Ritchie was nursing a nasty breakup. She decided to meet up with an old friend and paint the town. Boyfriends be damned. They drank and they danced late into the night and through the next morning. It was just what she needed. She probably overindulged in the adult beverages, but didn't she deserve it? By about a quarter after two in the morning, However, the social lubricant had begun to exact a toll on her coordination and judgment. Her exuberance drew attention from the security staff at the club, and Tess and her friend were asked to leave. A brief argument ensued between the girls and the bouncers, and that attracted attention from a wolf in geek's clothing. This is the story of a woman who said no, and the monster who wouldn't take no for an answer. And this is absolutely criminal. Tess Ritchie was the youngest of five girls raised in North Bay, Ontario, Canada. She moved to Toronto in 2014 and waited tables while she pursued her desire to take to the skies. She completed flight attendant training in 2017 and couldn't wait to get started. Shortly after taking residence in Toronto, Tess posted this video on YouTube describing an abusive relationship she said erupted with violence the day before her birthday the previous year. In September, I moved to Toronto for school. I met David and uh, we started hanging out and yeah, then a relationship formed. You know when like you figure something out when you're like, I know this isn't right and I know I should probably not do this, but at the same time you're like, but I want to do it anyways. Um, after having a bottle of wine, I went upstairs, I was tired. I looked at his computer and I told myself, don't be that girl, Tess, don't do it. But I had to. He got angry. We were up in his bedroom and uh, that's when he hit me. I remember during that, that altercation, he called me pathetic. Like he looked me in the eye, spit in my face and called me pathetic. For a week after that, a full week, I was, I was begging for him to forgive me. In what world? Talk about no respect for yourself. It's quite apparent she wore her heart on her sleeve and was struggling to take charge of her life. As she also mentioned, she was trying to reestablish connections with her friends whom she admitted alienating at the behest of a controlling boyfriend. So when Tess went through a tumultuous breakup in 2017, again, just before her birthday, she rang up an old friend named Riley Samard. They decided to meet for drinks at Cruz and Tango's, a lively drag bar in the heart of Gay Village. Before long, Tess's worries dissolved into the ever-reliable alcohol flowing as easily that night as the conversation with her old friend. The talkative twosome could be seen taking to the dance floor, and from all appearances, they were ready to let loose. And as we know, that's what they proceeded to do. Tess and Riley were now really buzzing, and so was the bar. They had a great time and went everywhere inside the club, upstairs and down. They also were seen going in and out several times to smoke cigarettes out front. One time, as they egressed, they walked right by two men making out and neither couple seemed to notice the other. 
having consumed a few too many cocktails. The bouncers told them to bounce, and the girls reluctantly exited the building. One of these lip-locked lads was 21-year-old Kalen Schlatter. He lived with his parents and younger brother in North Toronto and enjoyed video games and card games, especially Magic the Gathering, a multifaceted contest popular with brainiacs in their teens and twenties. These were just a few of many hobbies Kalen had, but they were the only ones he talked about in public. The hobby that arguably took up most of his time was one he kept under wraps and in his pants. He was obsessed with violent pornography and seemed to have a fetish for choking. More than one ex would later say Kalen choked them during sex, but that it was consensual. It became evident later that he didn't know the meaning of the word consent. So there Kalen was that night as the ladies passed by making out with a male friend he met on the dance floor. The next time Tess Ritchie would be this close to Kaylin Schlatter, they were also both seen on camera, but that time their interaction wouldn't be so benign. He did seem oblivious to Tess and Riley, but Kaylin certainly noticed Tess at some point that night, likely observing her unsteady gait and having impure impulses as she further imbibed. Eventually, their worlds would collide just outside the club that night. When Tess and Riley were booted out because of their behavior, Kaylin had already been lurking around just outside. He was seen on camera making conversation and making out, kissing a woman at one point and standing alone at others. When the ladies departed the disco, he took notice. Whether he had indeed seen her before or not, he now seemed transfixed with Tess. He waited for her until just the right moment. Kalen claims Riley recognized him from the bar and introduced him to a very drunk Tess. Just after meeting and chatting with Kalen, Tess hailed a passing cab. As it began to slow down and pull to the curb, Kalen waved it off and it sped up and passed them. He claims he did this because the slowing cab was blocking traffic. But things must have gone well from there for the trio, because around 3 a.m., a neighborhood resident named Michelle Teep was sitting outside when she heard their boisterous bellowing. They passed by the house, and Tess apologized for the ruckus, but Michelle took it all in good fun. They remained there and bantered for another half hour or so. At about 4 a.m., Riley received a text from her boyfriend requesting her presence, and she left the other two. Kaylin gave Riley the impression he'd look out for her friend. She'd be safe, she must have thought. At precisely 4.02, Tess ordered an Uber. Over the next few minutes, Kaylin continued talking to Tess, and they sat on a bench together as she waited. At some moment, they got up from the bench and started walking together. At 4.14 a.m., they triggered a motion-sensitive camera when they walked up this gravel driveway. Frustratingly, we will never know what happened over the next 45 minutes, because it's then the camera is activated a second time, and this time, Kalen strolled solo. The next day, Tess Ritchie's sister, Rachel, began to worry when she couldn't contact her. She knew Tess might have been busy, but it was not like her sister to stay silent all day. She's not talking to anybody. She's not communicating with any of her friends or any of her family, and that's just... She doesn't do that. Like, that's not... That's not Tess. After eventually calling local hospitals, she contacted police and reported her missing. Cops showed up and took a statement and canvassed the surrounding area. Their search could not have been a very thorough one, however, as the body was later discovered less than 40 meters from her home. For us metrically challenged Americans, that is about 131 feet. 
It was the way her body was found that was especially heartbreaking. A birthday present and a card sit among the flowers and candles that mark the spot where Tess Ritchie's body was found one day before her 23rd birthday. Ritchie had been missing for four days before her body was found, reportedly by her own mother, who traveled from North Bay to Toronto's Church in Wellesley neighborhood to find Ritchie, her youngest of five children. Instead, what she found was her daughter murdered. The cause of death, neck compression, not misadventure as first believed. Christine Hermiston recruited the assistance of family friend Anne Brazau. The two split up and searched Tessa's neighborhood. It wasn't long before Anne poked her head in that stairwell and saw her body lying there, still clad in her club attire, her purse and phone on the ground beside her. She had the awful task of informing her friend of what she found. The mother's worst fear had just been confirmed. Kaylin's DNA was later found on her pant leg. They had obtained a sample from the suspect after releasing surveillance footage showing his face to the national media. On December 10, Kaylin was watching TV at home when he saw his face on a police press conference. He called Toronto police and told them it was his mug on the news. They placed him under investigative detention and brought him in for questioning. His parents came along and thoughtfully brought a bottle of water in case their boy got thirsty from all that questioning. He did. And after retrieving the bottle from the trash, police later collected his DNA. It was sent off to the crime lab for analysis. When lab technicians compared that sample to the DNA from the semen found on Tessa's body, it was a match. On February 4, 2018, Kalen Schlatter had just finished watching the Super Bowl with his family when he was arrested at about 11 p.m. that night. Okay, so here is Kalen's version of events that happened that night. He testified in open court that Tess asked if she could make out with him. He got this all the time, of course, as he told cops when he was arrested. Undercover cops positioned in cells on both sides of his. He boasted to them he slept with over 40 women and had an absolutely fantastic phallus. The ladies practically begged him to bed. He was known to brag about the mass of his manhood, which is appropriate, because we can't think of a bigger dick than Kalen Schlatter. But the story of this deluded Don Juan came to a premature conclusion. We'll tell you just what we mean in a moment. But first, do you have an idea for a true crime story you'd like to see us cover? Let us know down below or contact us at absolutelycriminal.com. If you like our show, please hit thumbs up, subscribe, and ring the bell to be notified of our next episode. Now back to our story. Kalen told the undercovers he thought were sellies that the reason he left her there alone was because he was embarrassed. While they were making out, he said he came in his pants. In case his explanation is hard to swallow, we'll tell you what the prosecution said actually happened. And unlike this joke of a gentleman and his ridiculous alibi, there was absolutely nothing remotely funny or amusing about the stone-cold truth. He wanted them to have sex, and she said no. He decided that deserved a permanent punishment. But before he went, he took what he wanted. He told a cellmate that he tied a scarf around her neck, and by the time he climaxed, she was unconscious. He walked back down that driveway and left a strangled Tess Ritchie at the bottom of the steps to die, all alone. The Toronto police have faced sharp and steady criticism from many angles in this case. In a report by former Ontario Court of Appeal Judge Gloria Epstein, it was revealed that when police received evidence pinpointing where Tess was last seen alive, 
the lead detective assumed a search was made in that area, when in fact it hadn't been. She also blamed a heavy police workload, and they had no policy or procedure in place for investigating missing persons cases. As a result of what the court called serious flaws in the system, the Toronto police formed a dedicated missing persons unit, finally putting them on par with the other large Canadian cities. They are reviewing all unsolved cases dating back to 1990. Tess Ritchie was clearly having difficulties finding out who she was and carving out her own identity. But isn't that what our 20s are for? While most people gain more wisdom and insight throughout their lives, Tess never got that chance. It was forever taken from her at the base of that lonely stairway. He knew what he was taking, and it did not deter him in any way, shape, or form because he is a monster. An animal. Yeah, well, I love animals, so a monster. <laughs> Under the tree.